Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Q&A session as part of the PKT Connect meeting this year. For this Q&A session, we have um, two nephrologists here, um, one pediatric nephrologist, myself. I'm uh, Dr. Ashima Gulati. I'm a pediatric nephrologist at the Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC, where um, I'm also part of the Inherited and Polycystic Kidney Diseases Program, which is a multidisciplinary program where we care for children with uh, polycystic kidney diseases and other inherited kidney disorders. Um, and with this, I would also invite Dr. Neera Dahl to kindly introduce herself. Hi there. Uh, some of you may have met me already. I gave one of the talks yesterday. I'm an adult nephrologist at the Yale School of Medicine, um, primarily seeing um, uh, um, adult PKD patients. Um, and we have a big clinical trials program there that, we, that I also run. And we will be happy to take questions. Maybe Ashima, while you're here, I, I will start uh, with a question. As, as children are transitioning from pediatric care to adult care, uh, what advice would you give them? So, um, uh, you know, transition of care is an important piece that, you know, we, uh, so, uh, you know, at the Children's National Hospital at the Inherited and Polycystic Kidney Disease Program, for example, children who are nearing, um, you know, 18 years of age, I would say. So although we, you know, want to care for kids or children beyond, you know, say covering the transition period to like 19 or 20 and to, that is the motive is to ease the transition into adult nephrology world. Um, but um, so what we do is that, you know, at, so as soon as, you know, the child is about to turn 17 or 18, we just start having those conversations because typically, you know, these kids are coming to us not every month, but like four months, six months, or sometimes like every eight months. So uh, you want to cover that one or two years of the transition period by start, starting to have those conversations early on. So I think the timeliness of starting the conversations is an important piece that we keep in mind. And then depending on an individual, taking an individual approach with every family, trying to help them identify an adult nephrologist who would be best suited for the care or the needs that are uh, the demands of the particular patient is key. So I think we try to facilitate that not only at the provider level, but also at the level, level of the support staff. Great, thank you. There are some questions in the chat, uh, so I'm going to just uh, go through them. The first one is when should a teenager or young adult be tested for PKD uh, when a parent has PKD? I will answer that and then Ashima, I would love to hear your perspective too. Uh, yeah. So uh, what, what we recommend, we have this conversation a lot with, with our adult patients, kind of how and when to think about um, testing in children. Right now, um, there's no specific therapy for children with PKD, but that may change. There's a study with Tolvaptin going on um, in children, and we expect that that data will be published soon. Uh, but right now, um, because there isn't any specific therapy, what we say is to test only if there is an indication uh, the child is having blood in the urine or has hypertension or there's a, a clear reason to test, but otherwise not to test upfront until the child is an adult and can make that decision for his or himself. Um, Ashima, what do you recommend? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think I totally echo those um, thoughts and those uh, that advice. So to, up until the point that, you know, we have a specific therapy, um, I think uh, it's a matter of the family's informed choice that there is, you know, one that there is no specific therapy. So getting, a, you know, test or, uh, you know, finding out is, is, I think, majorly then, you know, rests on the family's decision, family's choice. And what we encourage, uh, you know, people is to just like 
talk to that, you know, talk about that and see what your options are and what you want to do. But I would say that, you know, in, in light of the current recommendations, I think what I tell families is that there are two major pieces. One is the blood pressure and the other is proteinuria. So protein leak in urine as part of the hyperfiltration process if the kidneys are affected. So if there is high blood pressure or there is evidence of protein leak in the urine and both of those things can be tested by the pediatrician, the child does not have to see a nephrologist for any of those two uh, assessments. So just having routine physical exams, having the blood pressure tested, having a urine protein tested by the pediatrician are two important pieces that you know can be picked up early. So at least we are not missing anything clinically if the child has polycystic kidney disease and, and has not come to clinical attention. And of course, if there is a sign or symptom, um, as you mentioned, blood in urine or any um, you know, pain in the back or in the kidney region or any particular sign or symptom, then um, uh, you know, um, early uh, assessment can be warranted. Excellent. The next question is uh, about diet. So this is, is the keto diet safe for PKD since it's high in protein? And uh, there's a, been a lot of interest in different diets recently. There was some nice work showing that uh, keto diets are intermittent uh, or time-restricted feeding, um, different types of dietary maneuvers might be really beneficial in ADPKD in animals. And we're still, uh, we're still looking at uh, some studies of this in patients. Not everything that we see in animals translates into, into patients. And so I think you have to be really, really careful kind of uh, jumping to this. The keto diet we worry about because it's a very high fat diet and there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease with PKD. So we don't recommend usually a very high diet, a high fat diet. I am still recommending um, a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables um, and balanced in terms of intake of, of fats and proteins uh, rather than a keto diet for my patients. But uh, there's definitely more work to come. And I think that people who are interested in intermittent fasting, for example, uh, that's a much less risky way uh, uh, to try and, and uh, take advantage of some of those dietary maneuvers. And, uh, you know, from the pediatric perspective, I would like to say that, you know, I think um, having to uh, be with a, um, you know, chronic condition, um, I think uh, this is a kind of an opportunity that we have in pediatrics that, uh, you know, having an, a lifestyle measure, um, you know, inculcated in, in the child early on so that, you know, having um, just um, uh, trying to make those healthy choices for the diet. Um, trying to increase fluid intake as part of the healthy dietary regimen and also sticking to a healthy diet. And um, obviously there is no clear recommendation of any particular diet, especially in growing kids when we want to just stress on a healthy diet. But having some of those uh, healthy diet kind of measures inculcated in the child early on really helps. Great, thank you. And I should, should have uh, started with also low salt, right? So for PKD, we think that's the the first and most important thing to do. Um, okay, the next question is, if a person has a family history of PKD but no cysts, at what age can they assume they do not have PKD and their children um, not be at risk? Uh, so from the um, adult nephrology perspective, the age we say is 40. Um, so uh, it's possible for people who have uh, PKD2 mutations to not have cysts detected early on, um, but may have cysts detected later in their adult years. So by ultrasound screening, um, FOTI is that, that uh, time cutoff, but um, there are other screening tests that are more sensitive for cysts. So for example, MRI will pick up small cysts that an ultrasound will miss. So if a young patient is being considered as a donor for uh, someone else in the family who has PKD, we'll sometimes either do uh, uh, the MRI or genetic testing to make sure that they don't carry the, the PKD um, uh, mutation. All right. Um,
so this is another uh, question. Of, this is about Gina, the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, protects against health insurance discrimination, but not life insurance discrimination. So does that weigh into the testing uh, equation? Does that impact testing? What do you think, Ashima? So I think uh, that is part of the, um, you know, the informed consent or, uh, you know, even for clinical testing, although they may or may not be like a written consent, but uh, it's important to have a genetic counselor uh, in, you know, as we involve, as we think of testing, it's always, uh, we always, uh, you know, try to counsel patients, not only at the provider level, but also at the genetic testing or the genetic counselor level, so that they have ac um, access to all the information as to what implications a clinical test would have. And this is uh, an important piece that is you communicated to the patients before a test is run, especially a clinical test, which will get into the medical record as opposed to a research test, which will be still be a research test, but not get into the medical record. So any test that gets into the medical record, I think this is an important piece of information that's given to the patients. Great. And I, to that, I would just want to add that um, GINA does not uh, protect against certain kinds of employment uh, issues. So we've certainly had patients who wanted to go into the military, for example, who were found to have PKD and then were not eligible for military service. So it can have uh, broader impacts that um, the diagnosis can have quite broad impacts. Um, there, there are a couple of questions and they're um, worded a slightly differently, but all asking the same thing, which is basically um, how to reduce immunosuppression after transplant. Um, uh, so um, are, are there, is there research or information about re reducing immunosuppression um, as the transplant uh, and patients age? Uh, so after a long time after transplant. And then a similar question, is there um, a, a way of doing some kind of immune system training in order to get off of immunosuppression? So um, uh, I'm assuming this is specifically in the context of uh, polycystic kidney disease. And um, I would, uh, you know, um, so, uh, you know, I think overall, and I think I would let uh, Dr. Dahl uh, answer this question more in the context of adult um, transplants, because typically the age of transplant for PKD is at least in adulthood, uh, for at least for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. But in general, for uh, children, you know, I think uh, post transplant, say, you know, for example, in the other, the recessive form of polycystic kidney disease or other forms of cystic kidney diseases. Uh, the major uh, concern is the steroid exposure for growth and, uh, you know, um, overall the transplant field has moved towards a steroid avoidance or a steroid uh, withdrawal kind of protocols and uh, uh, polycystic kidney disease falls into the, uh, uh, in the group of conditions where these can be safely um, used as opposed to some other conditions involving the kidney which really need steroid exposure even after the transplant. So I think polycystic kidney disease patients after transplant, we are safely able to avoid steroids um, uh, usually um, in, um, in the current era, but I would uh, defer to Dr. Dahl for any other information that might be available on adult um, uh, PKD patients post-transplant as to immune system um, training retroactively. Okay. Um, uh, so I think the first question, which is, can you start to reduce immunosuppression after transplant? Uh, so. Obviously in the first year after transplant, that's when the highest risk of rejection is. And that's when we worry the most about acute rejection. Uh, we're starting to, to learn a lot about chronic rejection and, and how that can kind of be sort of insidious, but then kind of creep up and cause loss of, of uh, kidney function of the transplant. And so I think there's a lot of interest in being able to reduce immunosuppression there are a lot of different strategies uh, to do this. And so um, I think in general, we try to reduce immunosuppression to that kind of sweet spot where we're not getting a lot of uh, 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 opportunistic infections or um, uh, increased risk of other problems, um, but maintaining um, uh, uh, rejection-free status. So I think it's a great question really to talk to 
the transplant nephrologist that you're seeing and seeing if there are options for reducing immunosuppression safely. And as you go, as there's increased time after transplant. Um, this is a, a question it says, how valuable do you think incorporation of renal urinary biomarkers um, reflective of total kidney volume cis progression could be in clinical practice? What do you think, Ashima? Um, so um, in practice, at least in children, I have we have not used um, any urinary biomarkers um, other than uh, just uh, urine protein. Um, is there any other specific biomarkers that you urinary biomarkers that you would be using in adults? Uh, there aren't. There are some papers saying urinary MCP one or. Uh, just pyuria in the urine might be an interesting biomarker. There's a paper that came out recently looking at uh, urea urine to plasma ratio as a biomarker for uh, the idea being that uh, the people who can make a more concentrated urine are the ones who are more likely to have preserved uh, um, uh, kidney function and sort of better overall status with PKD. But I don't think we're using any of those uh, clinically right now. They're really in the research setting uh, to try and help us predict uh, uh, who are those patients who are most likely to benefit from, uh, from the, the newer therapies that are being developed. I think clinically, um, what we look at a lot is total kidney volume. So when I see a patient for the first time, we're looking at some measure of total kidney volume um, as a way of determining what their risk of progression is. And that's usually the first thing we do when we're seeing a patient in clinic is trying to give them some kind of risk uh, prognosis in, in terms of what their individual disease process is likely to be. Yeah, and I think we also heavily uh, rely on the total kidney volume, at least estimation. So we, uh, in pediatrics and children, we necessarily don't like subject them to MRI for assessment of total kidney volume because there is limited clinical utility in doing that early on, at least till the time, you know, we have a specific therapy. But when the child is nearing 18 years of age um, and we're thinking about transition, I think uh, we think about having a baseline um, MRI associated total kidney volume or even sometimes just an ultrasound assessment of the total kidney volume to see uh, what their baseline is at, you know, when they're just uh, nearing adulthood and they could potentially be a candidate for more specific therapies uh, after transition. So that is what something that we use as a biomarker. And then again, urine protein is something, you know, not only by dipstick, but also by like a quantitative assessment. We try to um, do that every six months uh, to get an estimate of um, any hyperfiltration as a biomarker of more severe kidney involvement. Great. Okay. Um, so a couple more uh, um, transplant questions. So one, um, the stem cell studies for pre-transplant, is that the future of transplant? Um, and are there new blood biomarkers about detecting early rejection? So um, I think I, uh, I would uh, suggest that, you know, probably a transplant nephrologist would better be able to uh, give more insight into as to like either, you know, if there are like stem cell studies, which, um, um, you know, um, are really, you know, uh, there at that point that we can actually look up to them. Um, I'm not aware of any, uh, I mean, there is research, but I'm not aware of anything that's literally nearing, um, you know, or crossing the horizon and like, you know, we, and we can actually look forward to like um, hearing more about them very recently. So I'm not aware of any at this point. Okay. Um, you know, I think there was uh, some news recently, and this is probably what's being referred to that um, with the, the stem cell uh, uh, transplant, the stem cell uh, um, treatment pre-transplant that may reduce the need for immunosuppression post-transplant. And that's very, very exciting, but I think more to come on that. In terms of are there um, early blood markers for, um, for rejection? Again, I'm not a transplant nephrologist, but I know people are looking very carefully at things like cell-free DNA and other early markers of rejection. So I think there's a lot of information that, that will be pro coming about that. 
Um, okay. Uh, there is a question on male in infertility and ADPKD, um, and because mainly low motility due to cilia and um, um, is this common? Like, is this something that you would see in adult patients, male infertility is the question? So um, male infertility is certainly common in, um, uh, in men with ADPKD. And it is because of either cysts that form in the, in the, um, in the uh, collecting system, in the, in the ducts where the sperm are, are being uh, 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 maturing, or there's a, um, a impairment of sperm motility. So all of these are, are known factors. Um, and there's some infertility research going on. It's not specific for PKD, but the general infertility techniques that are used to treat all patients are also available for, for patients with PKD. Yeah, and I think there is another uh, question again saying, uh, is your hospital doing anything different to treat BK virus post-transplant um, besides just uh, lowering the immunosuppression or switching to cyclosporin and cytophobare. Um, I'm th um, in kids, we typically do IVIG um, for, um, to treat BK virus, but I think again, um, if there is anything specific for BK virus, um, other than doing this, um, I would just defer to a transplant nephrologist more, but typically it's reduction of immunosuppression, okay. IVIG and cytophobare. Um, at what age or what symptoms is tolvaptin prescribed and uh, how many years can someone be on tolvaptin? So um, as we know that pediatric um, trials are underway and um, but the uh, FDA approval is currently for um, on-label use for at least above 18 years of age. And uh, Dr. Dahl, in your clinic, like how many years, what's the longest probably you have that somebody's been on tolvaptin? Uh, so we were, um... A, a site for the initial tolvaptin trials, and we have patients who were um, in those studies, so starting in 2007, who have maintained good kidney function and remain on tolvaptin. So um, that's going on now for, for uh, 10, 12, uh, 15 years for some patients. Um, and that's really exciting actually to see that they're tolerating medication, that they're doing well. Um, but those are our longest patients. Um, typically, uh, we start when someone is ready to commit uh, to tolvaptin therapy. So it takes um, a fair amount of stability in that uh, you have to be able to have the, the blood drawing done monthly initially, and then every three months after that, um, you have to uh, be, you know, um, you have to be able to adapt uh, in terms of the the effect that the medication will have on lifestyle. And for some people that's very, very difficult to do um, and a reason that they come off of drug. Um, and, and then if someone is on drug and doing well and not having evidence of toxicity, we typically leave people on drug. My practice is uh, to leave people on drug until there's a reason they have to come off, like either they're starting dialysis or going to transplant, or we have to use other medications to help control some of the um, effects of the developing kidney disease that um, uh, would interfere with the tolvaptin. So we try and keep them on tolvaptin as long as possible, as long as they're tolerating it. Okay. Yeah, and um, so um, then, um, and are there any subspecialty clinics in the US for adults with ARPKD, congenital hepatic fibrosis? So, uh, so special, uh, I think uh, the PKD Foundation has uh, find a clinic um, kind of um, a feature in which you can find clinics for PKD in general. Uh, but um, I so you know ARPKD you know typically presenting early on, but as we know has a clinical spectrum, and so uh, adults with ARPKD I think would typically be managed. Uh, will be very few because it is a rare disease and you know having that kind of a spectrum in adults with ARPKD so I think it would be still be a PKD clinic are you aware of any um, other resource other than I would think the PKD yeah. Foundation would be the best resource to find a PKD clinic 
Yeah, and, and um, you know, I see patients predominantly with ADPKD, but I certainly also see adult patients with ARPKD. Uh, we are familiar with, um, with managing those patients. Uh, and often managing an ARPKD patient is uh, a multi-specialty uh, issue because there might be problems with liver cysts or there might, excuse me, with liver fibrosis um, or, or complications because of that liver fibrosis. And so it might be they're seeing a gastroenterologist as well as, as seeing me. But um, uh, some of the, the care is similar in terms of blood pressure management and things like that, and some of it is unique. But I would say in a clinic that sees a lot of inherited kidney disease, they would have expertise in seeing adults with ARPKD. And I think we're finding more adults with ARPKD with milder uh, evidence of disease as we're doing more genetic testing. So I think that that will also, um, uh, our our um, ability to treat those patients will also improve as we're seeing more of those patients. Yeah, typically in a pediatric clinic, uh, for example, our inherited diseases program for kids, you know, adolescents with ARPKD, as you said, you know, we will um, typically have that multidisciplinary kind of setup in which like the same visit can make use of not only the nephrologist, but also the hepatologist and a person from nutrition typically. So, um, yeah. Are there are people with PKD at higher risk for cystocele, rectocele, hernias? Um, so um, I think uh, I wouldn't be able to quote a percentage. This Dr. Dahl has more, um, you know, uh, numbers to associate with it. But I think, uh, you know, so yes, ex these are typically extracellular matrix kind of problems in which we have some kind of a connective tissue. Uh, problem in, uh, in uh, patients with polycystic kidney disease, and more so this is in the context of the autosomal dominant form of polycystic kidney disease, that you can have some kind of extracellular matrix problems and uh, hernias associated with it. Um, Dr. Dahl, do you have any, can you, uh, any numbers or any percentages about the risk estimation? Um, I, I think so. So for uh, abdominal hernias, this can certainly be more of an issue as the kidney volumes increase. Um, people with very large kidneys can have uh, a um, more tendency to develop abdominal hernias. Um, the the cystoceles can be part of um, uh, the adult, um, the, uh, the male infertility, which we talked about. Um, there can be cysts in other places, so pancreatic cysts, liver cysts, all of these are part of that um, uh, outside of the kidney manifestation that can be seen in ADPKD. And the, the numbers can be variable, so anywhere between uh, 5 to 10 percent for some of these to upwards of uh, 70 to 80 percent for the liver cysts. Yeah, and I think uh, we missed one or two questions from Catherine in the audience. So she asked, Catherine asked, how would one go about finding a qualified post-transplant dietitian? Uh, so for example, uh, the local medical clinic has a dietitian, but maybe she, uh, you know, she's not the one that uh, you know, the patient would be or the caregiver would be interested in using. So how does one find a qualified post-transplant dietitian? Post uh, dietitians, uh, you know, post transplant. I think um, um, I think almost every transplant program would be multidisciplinary and should have access. But if the local dietitian is not somebody you want to use, uh, is there another resource that you know for a post transplant dietitian? I, you know, I would say that uh, I would ask within the transplant program to see if there's someone else that's possibly available. Um, otherwise, uh, for, for us, we have a pretty big PKD um, uh, program and we have a dietitian that works specifically with us. And so maybe if there's a, a program like that, there's someone who already knows a lot of kidney specific uh, um, uh, information who may then be able to guide that selection for a post-transplant um, uh, dietitian. And I would say post-transplant, um, what we worry about from a dietary perspective is the advice for, for the um, dietitian is based on what the kidney function is. So the same as it would be for someone who is pre-transplant, when the kidney function is very good, we're focusing on low salt, 
rich fruits and vegetables. And then as the kidney function declines and someone is getting closer to that new, uh, to that transplant failing, there may or may be more restrictions in terms of phosphorus and potassium and things like that. Um, and certainly there's a lot of, of uh, uh, knowledge with, with the dietitians about how to counsel people regarding CKD as the transplant is, is starting to fail. There is also a question about tra traditional Chinese medicine and specifically a spleen diet. Do you have any information on that? I am not aware of any traditional Chinese medicine uh, personally. Yeah, I, I don't have information on that. I'm not aware of the, the spleen diet. Um, and then have there been any studies on how ADPKD affects self-image and mental health, uh, given that the cystic kidneys, they grow, and then the patient loses control of their body size? Um, in the pediatric clinic, um, you know, I think the um, mental health question is still relevant because the child, children are still trying to understand what ADPKD means for them, for the family. And, you know, um, many of these patients are coming, kids are coming from ADPKD families, but the impact on mental health is, I think, something that, um, you know, we, uh, I think it really needs to be systematically looked at. But according to what the self-image changes uh, would be, and uh, when the cystic kidneys, they really grow and, um, you know, when they become a limitation or uh, when the patient loses control of their body size, um, is uh, something that, you know, we don't see early on, but I think would uh, maybe a problem that you see in the adult clinic? So uh, it, there is definitely a lot of concern regarding uh, um, uh, depression, mental health uh, with uh, adults with uh, chronic inherited disease, right? So oftentimes uh, these are... are um, patients who have known about the disease for a long, long time. Um, there's a lot of interest now in what we call patient reported outcomes. Um, it's one of the big features of the PKD Foundation Registry. So um, if, if you haven't been on there, this is the kind of information we're trying to collect. We're, we're actually really trying to understand the correlations between uh, kidney size, liver size, and how this has impact on mental health and physical functioning. Um, from a, a liver image perspective, uh, we know that patients with very severe uh, polycystic liver disease, so very large livers, tend to have more problems with uh, physical functioning uh, scores, uh, more trouble with things like bending over and things like that. Uh, they, in, in the studies that they've done, they didn't see a change in mental health outcomes, um, but we know that, uh, that depression can be a, a common problem, right? And that body image uh, can, can be a common problem in, in, uh, in affecting that. So I think there's more, more research and more interest in that to come. Um, and hopefully it's something that if you're feeling that there are some issues around that. Hopefully you're feeling also comfortable discussing that with your nephrologist because there are a lot of good uh, therapies that we're starting to look into for, for managing those kinds of things. Yeah, and then I think there are one or two questions related to mostly the cardiovascular impact of PKD. And um, I think uh, it relates uh, the questions um, asked for one, um, you know, the direct, I would just tease them out into two pieces. One is the direct effect of um, ADPKD as a chronic kidney disease impacting the heart in terms of like hypertension. And, um, you know, when would you actually get an echocardiogram typically for Children, as you know, as part of their routine um, annual physicals, blood pressure checks are done. Um, you know, after kids are like three years of age, it's like every year. But in uh, in the PKT clinic or the inherited kidney clinic, you know, every uh, follow up at least every six months with a blood pressure check. And uh, what we usually do is ask them to maintain a blood pressure log either with the school nurse or with the uh, with their primary care provider and have those readings available to us at the time of the clinic visit, which is much more informative than having just like a single walk in office visit. 
Um, but echocardiograms, uh, I would say if there is hypertension control, uh, even if it's controlled on um, one medication, say an ACE inhibitor, doing an echocardiogram, at least a baseline, and then one to two years is what we would typically do. And in terms of like measures for cardiovascular measures for PKD patients, we would stress on um, blood pressure control and um, salt intake statins, although not recommended in all cases, but we would typically um, um, look at the lipid profile and see if there is a candidacy for statins and then looking at the exercise regimen and the total overall BMI, which is very um, important for general kidney health and also for CKD progression. Um, for for this, I, I want I think I want to elaborate on this question and uh, stress upon the importance of blood pressure regulation. And somebody asked, are there any preventative cardiovascular measures a PKD patient should take? And Dr. Dal, do you want to just talk um, briefly about what the importance of blood pressure control and how large trials in ADPKD have shown that blood pressure control is really something that can uh, slow down PKD progression? Yeah, uh, sure. So. Um, the, the trial that you're referring to is the HALT-PKD trial, and that looked at different blood pressure outcomes. And what they saw was with the lower blood pressure target, so we target 110 over 75 for adults, uh, that there was less growth of kidney cysts. And so we really try and, and talk to patients about blood pressure a lot. We know that uh, salt um, intake is associated with increase cyst growth. So we also talk a lot about salt intake and reducing salt intake. In terms of other general measures for, um, for cardiovascular health, uh, we know that cardiovascular disease is what in, at the end affects PKD patients and, and um, can have very significant outcomes. So in the adult space, we're looking at lipid profiles and we're deciding should they be on a statin just for the lipid lowering effect uh, we're typically not getting echoes, at least my practice is not, unless I hear um, a, uh, a murmur or unless there's some other clinical reason to get the echo. But all of this stuff that's heart healthy, so managing diabetes, maintaining an, a good body weight, not smoking, all of those things are critical components to managing kidney health. And we really stress the importance of, of doing all of those things. Um, some of the recent data that I think is particularly important in the adult space is we know that um, obesity increases the rate of cis progression. So we have now started talking to our patients a lot about maintaining an ideal body weight. There are now uh, very good new therapies for helping with uh, medical management of weight loss. We talk about those as well as part of this preventive uh, strategy. Um, and then, um, so there's a question that is interstitial nephritis, cystitis, sorry, interstitial cystitis more common in ADPKT women? And can a medication uh, that increases the pH probably help? Um, I, can, um, I can start to answer that. So uh, I don't think interstitial cystitis is more common in ADPKT women. This is a very specific a uh, uh, condition that can occur where there's uh, more inflammation within the bladder. Um, in terms of a high pH medication, so um, the reason that may be beneficial not um, um, for, for anyone with PKD is uh, for, uh, we know that kidney stones are a common problem for people with PKD. And the typical uh, reason that those stones form is because of low citrate in the urine. So if you have something that increases, like citrate, for example, that increases the pH in the urine, that may help decrease the risk of kidney stones. Uh, there may be some additional benefits from, from, uh, for citrate, and that's certainly something that's being actively studied. Um, but I don't think there's a, a specific link to interstitial nephritis and PKD. Um, is there, uh, uh, for um, highly sensitized patients, so for example, patients who have high uh, panel reactive antibodies, are there like specific transplant programs who would uh, take those patients to treat those highly sensitized patients? I know in children, um, you know, our center, um, you know, um, 
we have a transplant program and we do um, you know transplant kids who have uh, although it's less uh, likely the case in pediatrics than it is in adults and it's you know more problem in adults or with like retransplants uh, but uh, highly sensitized patients can get transplanted in um, many bigger um, pediatric programs, but also, uh, you know, in the adult world, is there um, are there specific programs that can cater to the needs of highly sensitized patients? There are. So typically, those highly sensitized patients get uh, uh, high doses of uh, immunotherapy before the transplant, and then get transplanted. Um, and there, uh, I'm predominantly on the East Coast, so I know there are some centers, major transplant centers in New York, um, in, in Baltimore, at Hopkins has a very big program. So there are uh, centers that will do that. And to, if your transplant center does not uh, do that, um, like Yale does not do that, then they typically will help us refer patients to uh, a center where that is possible. Uh, going back to the cardiovascular problems, are there other symptoms of cardiovascular problems if, say, the blood pressure is okay and the statins, so I'm saying the lipid profile is okay? Uh, for example, um, is fatigue or shortness of breath related to cardiovascular problems? I think it is majorly dependent on what the age of the patient is, what other risk factors or comorbidities are. Uh, but yes, if there is fatigue or shortness of breath, I would certainly recommend a good evaluation by uh, starting maybe with the, your primary uh, care provider, but then also talking to your nephrologist about that. Yeah, and I to that I would add um, shortness of breath can be a common symptom for people who have large liver cysts. Uh, so it may not be related to a cardiovascular issue. Um, and fatigue certainly is common as kidney function declines. So I think part of the reason to see uh, maybe a nephrologist or a cardiologist is to really um, um, figure out which of those organ systems is the one that may be uh, creating the problems and creating the symptoms. And, and the other point is, are those symptoms, um, even if they're bothersome, are they worrisome, right? So someone who's short of breath because they have um, heart failure, we're much more worried about that than someone who's short of breath because they're having difficulty taking a full breath because of a, a liver cyst problem, right? It's, a, um, it's a, the same degree of discomfort for the patient, but, but one is, is a serious medical issue and one may be something that can be managed symptomatically. Yeah, typically, you know, with chronic uh, kidney disease or, um, you know, secondary to ADPKD, um, I assume these patients are seeing a primary uh, care provider and a nephrologist. So in, in pediatrics or with kids, you know, uh, we as nephrologists or as somebody who are managing kids with inherited or chronic or, you know, genetic kidney diseases or polycystic kidney disease, we work very closely with the uh, pediatrician to, um, you know, manage, co-manage and whenever there is a question. In, on the adult side, is that the same kind of equation you share with the uh, primary care provider? Like, for example, your patients, like, you know, if the patient has a fatigue or shortness of breath, which could be related to, you know, one or two different things, is the nephrologist the key, a key person to contact first, or do they go to their primary care provider and then you communicate with the PCP, or how does it go usually? Um, I, I think that that it can go in, in different ways, right? So some of my patients already have a cardiologist, so they might be seeing the cardiologist or seeing their primary care provider. Um, if they come to me with those symptoms, we can certainly start um, the workup looking for those things, right? Um, order the echo, order the referrals, do those kinds of things. Uh, so it's very much a shared care model. Um, and uh, and uh, really just making sure that the patient has a, a home base that they can check in on. Uh, for a lot of our patients, particularly the patients with stage four and stage five CKD, uh, we end up being the, the doctor that they're seeing the most because we're seeing them every three or four months and then, then maybe even every one or two months as they're getting closer to dialysis or transplant. And so we might be more aware of those issues and, and managing them first before they, they go to their primary doctor. I think we're running out of time here. I don't know if you have time um, to just quickly um, take one more question here. And it asks if ADPKD affects pancreatic function. 
Um, and uh, I think uh, pancreatic cysts are described in ADPKD, but not necessarily causing any clinical problems. And if uh, there is uh, somebody who has cystic kidney disease, at least uh, you know early on in um, childhood or adolescence, and we're thinking about maybe ADPKD, but also has pancreatic involvement, we want to investigate for some other uh, conditions such as HNF1 beta to see if there is you know if there is pancreas involved or if there is blood sugar problems. Uh, but I don't think clinically uh, pancreatic function is a big um, player in ADPKD, at least uh, in the clinic. Yeah, I think sometimes, especially with all of the MRIs we're getting, we see cysts in the pancreas, and that can be part of the finding of PKD. But it typically, um, and it there may be occasional like a high amylase level, a measure of pancreatic uh, enzyme activity, but typically there isn't a, a pancreatic insufficiency or pancreatic problem. Mm -hmm. And then um, just, uh, you know, uh, before we just end, I think there is, uh, so uh, someone is asking if uh, specifically there are hospitals that uh, patients have been referred to on the East Coast um, and um, uh, where to get treated. I'm assuming this is like asking for PKD clinics. So, um, and I think uh, overall uh, the PKD Foundation um, has is like, I think the best resource that anybody can wish for and, uh, you know, of like find a clinic option or even if like the website if there is not no information if, if there is information that you're looking for and not getting I think emailing the PKD foundation and uh, you know who will then connect you to the person who can um, answer more on that front in, as to like where the PKD clinics or the hospitals that you could connect to in your region yeah.